Genesis, <laughs> Genesis chapter 3, if you have your Bibles. And this morning we're going to continue our series entitled Don't Listen to the Lies. And we've been talking about the lies of the enemy and how as, as Christians, as the church, not only have we come to a place where we're entertaining and we're listening to the lies, but we've actually begun to believe the lies and allow that to influence and control the way we live our life. And so last week we talked about what? Compromise. We looked at the life of David and, and we talked about compromise and how that the enemy comes to us and says, it's no big deal. Why don't you just try this? Why don't you just do it? Why don't you just say it? It's not going to be that big of a deal and how little compromises add up to one big giant compromise. And so this morning we're going to continue in this thing and we're going to look in Genesis chapter 3 and we're going to look at a topic that many lies come from that is the source of many lies in our life. Lies like uh, I'm a terrible person. Lies like God can't love me. Lies like God won't forgive me. Lies like I'm unworthy. I'm unlovable. I'm just an overall bad person. And we're talking about shame this morning. And, and if you have your Bibles, and if you're at Genesis chapter 3, say, I'm there. And if you're ready, say, let's go. We're going to begin reading in verse number 6. And the Bible says that when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? And he answered him, I am here. I, or, excuse me, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. For your word, Lord, I thank you that your word does not return void, but it accomplishes the purpose that it was sent out for. And today, Lord, I pray that your purpose would be accomplished in our hearts and in our lives. I pray that you would make us that good soil, that your, your word would take root, and that it would bring forth a harvest 30, 60, and 100 fold. I pray that we would not just be hearers of your word, but doers as well, Lord. I pray that you would open our eyes, open our ears, that we would hear what you would have to say to us today. Anoint these words and speak through me in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. This morning we're talking about shame, and it's a topic that many of us struggle with. I believe there are things in each and every one of our lives that we were, are ashamed of. How many of you would agree with that? There are things that you've done that when you think back, you say, man, if everybody really knew what I did, if everybody knew what I said, if everybody knew where I went, they wouldn't talk to me again. And you've allowed shame to creep in. And I believe it's something that we all do. Maybe it's not even something big. Maybe it's something small. Maybe you yelled at your kids and the enemy has come. And not only do you feel bad for yelling at your kids, but the enemy is coming. He's telling you, you're just a bad parent. You're a terrible parent. Now when your kid grows up, he's not going to like you. Now your relationship with him is never going to be the same again. And there's shame that you begin to feel for something that you did. Something big, something small. It's something that we all deal with. Each and, every, each and every one of us, we all deal with it because we've all sinned. How many of you guys have ever sinned? Those of you that aren't raising your hands, you just sinned because you lied. So now you're a sinner. Turn to your neighbor and say, I know you're a sinner. <laughs> say, because I'm a sinner too. See, we've all sinned. The New Living, if you read the New Living Translation in this story, the Bible says that they ate, the, they eat the fruit, and the moment they eat the fruit, they immediately felt shame because they were naked. See, shame will always follow sin, and since you've all sinned, some of you this morning, some of you when that car cut you off on the way to church, only to realize you pulled into the same parking lot after you flipped them off. And you get to the same place and you park next to each other and get out and say, God bless, like nothing just happened. <laughs> don't act like you don't, that's never happened to you. There was one time I was working at Bellevue University and I was driving down 370 on my way to work and I was running late and this red van pulled out in front of me and I just laid on the horn, man. It put my hand like, what are you doing? You know, I'm honking at him and I pulled, 
I go to pass him because I got to get to work. So I pull next to him, and I'm going to pass him, and I look, and it's the lady who sits two cubicles down from me. <laughs> she looked over, and she saw me, and she waved. <laughs> and I could do nothing but wave back and just carry on. And I beat her to work, and she got there and said, good morning, John. <laughs> and in my shame, I said, good morning. I'm sorry. It's okay. And she was so gracious. But listen. Some of you sinned this morning. Some of you sinned this morning when your kids wouldn't get out of bed. Don't look at me like that. Like you don't sin when your kids don't listen to you. We're all sinners. And what happens is when you sin, shame will immediately come in behind it. See, it's funny the way that the devil works because initially he'll come to you when he wants you to do something. He'll come to you and say, hey, check this out. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal if you do this. It's not a big deal to sleep with your boyfriend. You love him and he loves you. You're not married, but one day you're going to be married. So it's not that big of a deal. And then what happens is you say, you know what? You're right. It's not a big deal. And so you go ahead and do it. And the minute you do it, the enemy goes from it's not a big deal to, oh my gosh, what did you do? What were you thinking? This is like the hugest deal and the biggest thing and the biggest mess up you could have ever done. It's not a big deal. What do you mean it's not a big deal? It's a huge deal. The enemy goes from it's not a big deal to it's a big deal. The enemy goes from nobody's going to know about it to everybody's talking about you. And you stay away from church for six months because of something you did and some shame that you feel and you think everybody at church is talking. Let me just tell you right Nobody's talking about you, okay? Let me just clear that up for you right now. You're not that important <laughs> that everybody is just sitting around. Did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, yeah, I can't believe that. Let's call everybody on the church prayer list and talk to them. <laughs> Listen, it doesn't work that way, but the enemy will sit there, and he will tell you that that's what's happening to get you to stay away from church, to get you to wallow in your shame, to get you to wallow in your guilt and in your condemnation and this and this. Listen, that's not from God. See, conviction is from God. Shame is not. And I think the problem is a lot of times we've let the two kind of get blurred and kind of run over into the other. And we say shame and we say conviction and sometimes we feel shame and we think it's conviction. Sometimes we say conviction and we think it's shame. And so today I wanted to just really quickly, before we get into the text and move along in there, I want to, to define the difference and let you know what the difference is. See, so I looked up the definition of shame. I looked it up in the dictionary, and, and it defines shame as the painful feeling arising from the consciousness of something dishonorable, improper, ridiculous. Has anybody done anything ridiculous that they've been ashamed of? I could tell you a bunch of stories. Angel could probably take the microphone and speak for the next three hours of things that I've done that are ridiculous. But it's a, it's a feeling of, of pain arising from something you've done. And guilt is defined as a feeling of responsibility for some offense, crime, or wrongdoing. See, shame is the pain that you experience. Guilt is the responsibility that you take for it. Does that make sense? Shame says, I'm a bad person. Guilt says, I made a bad decision. Guilt says, I'm taking responsibility for it. Yes, I messed up, but I'm going to commit to doing everything I can never to do that again. Shame says, yes, I made a bad decision, and because of it, I'm a bad person, and because I don't want you to see that I'm a bad person, I'm going to put up this wall around me that you will never see past. See, shame will lead you away from Jesus. Guilt and conviction will lead you towards Jesus. Conviction leads you towards the cross. Shame leads you away from it. The problem is, too many of us, instead of feeling conviction and experiencing conviction, which is from the Holy Spirit, instead of experiencing conviction when we make a mistake and going to God and saying, God, I need your forgiveness, I need your mercy, I need your grace. We experience shame and we allow the enemy to come in and permeate our thoughts, permeate everything that we do, and now we feel shame for the thing that we've done and we run away from God's presence. See, shame is a terrible thing. I would propose to you today that shame is even more destructive in your life than sin itself. 
You say, Pastor, how is that possible? The Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and so what's more destructive than death? Yes, the wages of sin are death, and yes, when you sin, it creates that separation between you and God. What, what fellowship can light have with darkness? And so when you sin, it creates that separation. But just the separation in itself, God is, 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 is right there ready to bridge that gap the moment you say go. The moment you confess with your mouth that you're a sinner and believe in your heart, Jesus says, all right, we're good. See, sin creates that gap, but shame will make you stay there. Sin will, sin will put, put separation between you and God, and shame will ensure that you never go back to where you used to be. That's why I say shame is more destructive. See, we all sin. I sin all the time. <gasps> Pastor John sins all the time. Yeah, absolutely. You do too. Paul, in, in his writing, said, look, we're all sinners. I'm the chief of them. I'm the worst sinner that ever lived. I'm the worst sinner that ever walked the face of the earth. That's what the Apostle Paul says. We're all sinners. We've all sinned. But do we let shame keep us in our sin? Or do we let the conviction bring us back to the Lord? See, shame can control everything you do. I heard this story about this young boy. And, and in the story, his name's Johnny. And being that my name's John, and growing up, every time you know, somebody told a story, it was about little Johnny. And typically, little Johnny's doing something that little Johnny shouldn't be doing. And so I'm going to change his name. And, and I'm not going to call him little Johnny. Uh, instead, I'm going to call him Nick. All right? I'm going to call him little Nick. And so I heard this story about little Nick, and, and Nick and his sister are going to visit their grandparents. All right? So Nick and his sister get to their grandparents' house, and, and Nick's grandma comes running up to him and says, Nick, I got you a present. And he takes the present, and he opens it, and it's a slingshot. Like, mistake number one. What are you doing giving a little boy a slingshot? There is no good that can come from that. And so she gives him the slingshot, so he's all excited. His grandparents live out in the country, so he immediately runs out in the woods, and he's trying to shoot trees, and he's trying to shoot bushes, and he's trying to shoot squirrels, and he sets up these little targets, and Nick is the worst shot in the history of slingshots. Couldn't hit the broad side of the barn if he wanted to. And so Nick comes home dejected. Man, I got this cool slingshot. I can't hit nothing. I'm just a terrible slingshot shooter guy, and I'm just the worst. And he looks across the yard, and he sees his grandma's pet duck. And on impulse, Nick picks up a rock. I mean, he hasn't hit anything all day. Why would he hit this duck all of a sudden? So he picks up a rock. He puts it in a slingshot. He pulls it back. He takes his aim, and he lets it go. Now, how many of you have ever thrown a rock at a bird? Yes, I'm interrupting a story with a story. How many of you have ever thrown a rock at a bird? What happens, even if your rock is heading right for that bird, what happens when the, when the rock is like two inches away? The bird flies away. I don't know how they do it. It's like this sixth sense, like, you know, field around them that the second something gets in that, they just take off. But you throw a rock and the bird takes off. I'm going to interrupt a story within a story for another story. One time I was out golfing. This is how I tell stories. You just got to get used to it. One time I was out golfing. And we were on the tee box waiting for the group in front of us, and there was a tree probably from me to that pole, and a friend of mine says, I'll give you 20 bucks if you hit that bird. There's a bird sitting on a branch. So I took my golf ball like, okay, yeah, right. And I just went like, I didn't even like throw it as hard as I could. I just, you know, just tossed it. So I tossed it at this bird, and I'm expecting the bird to just fly away. Well, the, rocks, the, the, the golf ball is getting closer, getting closer, getting closer. Boom! <laughs> I kid you not. Smacks the bird, bird falls out of the tree onto the ground, and we just looked at each other. And our reaction was probably a lot like Nick's reaction, going back to the original story. You hit the bird, the bird dies, and you're like, did that just happen? How is that possible? For all of you that are looking at me like, you bird killer, I'm sorry. I've dealt with that shame in that area, so we're good. But how did that happen? And so Nick runs over to the duck, and he looks around. He doesn't see anybody. And so what am I going to do with this duck? Grandma loves this duck, and so I'm going to bury it in the garden. So he buries this duck in the garden and turns around. And when he turns around, he sees his sister standing there looking at him. And she doesn't say anything, but she's just standing there like, you know, giving him that look like, I see what you're doing. 
and you're going to pay for that too. So what happens is she goes inside. Well, grandma goes in, she cooks dinner, everybody eats dinner, and grandma says, Sally, this is Nick's sister, Sally, would you like to come and, and help me do the dishes now that dinner is over? And Sally says, actually, grandma, Nick was telling me today that he wanted to help you do dishes tonight. Isn't that right, Nick? And Nick says, yes, I did want to do dishes tonight. So he goes and he helps grandma with the dishes. And then the next morning they wake up and, and grandma says, Sally, are you ready to, to go outside and, and do your chores and help me around the house? And Sally says, well, grandma, actually, Nick said he wanted to do all my chores today. Isn't that right, Nick? And Nick says, uh, yeah, grandma, that's right. I want to do all of Sally's chores. And so for two days, Nick is going around the house doing all of his chores and all of his sister's chores. And finally, he gets to the end of it. It's like, it's not even worth it. Like, I'm so fed up with this. Like, I'm not doing your chores anymore. I'm just going to tell Grandma what happened. And Sally says, well, go ahead. See what Grandma does. And so Nick goes to Grandma and says, Grandma, there's something I need to tell you. I need to confess. I need to come clean. It's been killing me. It's been eating me up inside. Grandma, I killed your duck with my slingshot. And Grandma says, I know. <laughs> she said, I was standing there in the kitchen looking out the window. And I saw the whole thing happen. She said, because I love you, I've already forgiven you. I was just wondering how long you were going to let your sister keep you a slave because of it. And this morning, God is here. And this morning, God says, I saw what you did. I, seen the th I heard the things that you said. I saw what you did when you thought nobody else was looking. I saw the whole thing happen. And because I love you, I've already forgiven you of that. I'm just wondering how long it's going to keep you away from me. I'm just wondering how long you're going to let the enemy keep you a slave because of the shame he's making you feel because of it. See, this morning, shame controls us. Shame permeates our thoughts. It's not so much that you, you did something wrong, but now shame makes you believe that you're a bad person and that God wants nothing to do with you. See, as I look at the story of Adam and Eve and as I look at the fall of man, as I, as I read this text, there's several things that, that stood out to me that I want to point out to you today, and I don't want to take up a whole lot of your time. But the first thing that I see is shame changes the way you view yourself. Shame changes the way you view yourself. See, the Bible says in verse 7 that, their eyes were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together to make a covering for themselves. And my question was this, were they naked before? Yeah. Were they naked after? Yeah. So what, shame, what, what, what changed? Why all of a sudden the change? Why were they, able, were, what, were they able to look at their nakedness before and feel no shame? And now all of a sudden they look at their nakedness and it's like, we got to go and we got to hide and we got to cover ourselves. What happened? The answer is sin entered the world. And with sin came shame. And now they looked at their nakedness with shame. See, look, being naked is a good thing. You're like, oh, what? <laughs> I'm going to say it again. Being naked is a good thing. Nakedness, I'm not talking just physical nakedness, okay? So get your heads out of the gutter. I'm not talking about physical nakedness. I'm talking about emotional nakedness. I'm talking about spiritual nakedness. Because what is being naked? Being naked is being transparent. Being naked is being open. Being naked is not covering something up. Being naked is not taking that little thing that you don't want anybody else to see and putting it in the closet and hoping nobody comes to clean out your closet. Be being naked is not putting something under your bed hoping your mama doesn't find. Being naked is not hiding something from your husband or hiding something from your wife. Being naked is, look, this is me. This is all, this is all of me. And so being naked is a good thing. In their innocence, nakedness was a good thing. See, before sin entered the world, they were innocent in their transparency and their openness was a good thing. But now when sin comes, shame comes, and they look at their transparency, they look at their openness and say, I got to hide this. I got to get rid of whatever this thing is. And so shame changes the way you view yourself. See, yes, I sinned, I made a bad decision, but when it's shame, it's not I made a bad decision, it's I'm a terrible person. Shame tells you 
you're unlovable. Shame tells you that you're unworthy. Shame tells you that you're a failure. Shame tells you that you're a screw-up. Shame tells you that God won't forgive you. Yeah, I read the Bible. Yeah, I, I read about God's forgiveness. Yeah, I, I sing songs about God's forgiveness. But that, you know, that applies to everybody else. That doesn't apply. Pastor, I've done some really, really bad stuff. That doesn't apply to me. God can't, God can't forgive me. My kids won't forgive me. My kids will never forgive me for what I've done. My wife will never forgive me. My husband will never forgive me for the things that I've said, for the things that I've done. See, shame changes the way that you view yourself. Instead of looking at yourself with the possibility and looking at yourself the way that God views you, you begin to look at your life through the lenses of shame and say, how can I ever expect anything good to happen to me? How can I expect God to love me after everything that I've done? How can I expect God to forgive me after the many times that I've sinned? And you look at your life through the lenses of shame, and I'm so glad this morning that God does not look at us through lenses of shame. But instead, God views us through lenses of grace. God views us through lenses of mercy. God views us through his own lenses. He says, take off those glasses and put my glasses on and see what I see. Because when you look at your life through a, a lens of shame, you will never be good enough. And let me just tell you right now, you'll still never be good enough. But because of God's grace, he says, look, I know you don't deserve it. There's nothing you could do that would cause you to deserve my love. There's nothing you could say that would cause you to, to deserve my grace and my mercy and all of this, 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 this awesomeness that I give you. There's nothing that you could do to deserve that. But because of my grace, because that's the way I see you is through lenses of grace, I will still give it to you, even though you don't deserve it. See, God's mercy and God's grace are two very powerful things, and too few of us live our lives with a full understanding of what that means to us. See, mercy is not getting what you deserve, okay? Mercy is you not going to hell. That's God's mercy. You deserve hell. The wages of sin is death. Each and every one of us deserves that. But God doesn't give us what we deserve. That is his mercy. His grace is giving you something even though you don't deserve it. His grace is giving you the forgiveness even though you don't deserve it. His grace is blessing you even though you've done nothing to deserve it. His grace is, is sufficient for all of the things that you need. See, that's the difference between mercy and grace, and that's the way that God views you. God doesn't view you in light of your failures. God views you in light of his grace. So this morning, shame changes the way you view yourself. The second thing is shame changes the way you view God. The Bible says that then... The man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man, where are you? And he answered, I heard you, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid. Now this morning, I want you to put yourself in their shoes, okay? You're Adam, you're Eve. You were just created. You were living in this garden. It's beautiful. You have everything that you could possibly want. You walk with God on a daily basis. You interact. You talk. It, physical present God, God is with you in the garden. Pretty awesome. You're Adam. You are ruler over everything. Adam, you're going to rule over all this. Okay, that sounds great. Adam, name all the animals. Okay, that sounds great, but God, I'm a little bit lonely, like it's just me here, and I can't really talk to the animals, because then they'll look at me like I'm crazy, uh, and so God, can you, can, you, can you help me out with that? <laughs> and just like that, like the sound of a thunderous, God... You're Adam. <laughs> that was crazy. You're Adam. God, can you help me out with that? And God says, okay, here's this woman. Now, you're not naked, but now you're naked, and the woman's naked, and she's there, and she's your companion. And you, Thanks, God. God, you're the man. God, you're the best. Like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, God, good looking out. I appreciate it. And so you're here with God, and my question is this. What had God done to this point? to justify their response. Like, it's not like God was going through the garden just slapping people, right? 
Like, God wasn't through walking through the garden just like walking up being like, what are you doing? He wasn't doing that. And so there was nothing that God had done previously to warrant them being afraid and running and hiding from God. What changed? It was their shame. See, your shame will change the way you view God. God, I know you can forgive everybody else, but God, you just can't forgive me. What? Who are you to say what God God can and cannot do? It changes the way you view him. There was a time a couple weeks ago that I was watching TV in the living room. I mean, I was was reading my Bible, (laughs) and I I was sitting there, and the kids were playing out back, and I heard this. Boom! And I heard, I'm going to tell dad. And so I got up and I walked outside. Now, rewind a few weeks. I had found this basketball hoop and I had taken it off the pole. The pole was broken. Somebody gave it to me. So I took it off the pole and I mounted it onto our deck so the boys could play basketball in the backyard. And it was mounted at like five feet. And so it was just low enough to where, like, if they had a a chair or a cooler or something, that they could jump up and dunk it. And so we had this basketball mounted in the, the, the hoop mounted in the backyard on the deck, and I kept telling Jace, don't hang on the rim. It's just a fiberglass backboard. Make sure, whatever you, don't hit, but he's obsessed with LeBron James. And so he thinks it's, like, cool to dunk the basketball and hang and, like, that's the cool thing. Like, why couldn't you be a fan of, like, Doug McDermott or something and just, like, shoot threes all day? Like, just shoot the ball. John Stockton, lay up. You don't need to dunk it. Just put some little short shorts on you. You could be John Stockton all day. He says, no, I want to be LeBron, so I'm going to dunk it. So I said, okay, well, don't hang on the rim. Don't hang on the rim. I was telling him all the time, don't hang on the rim. So when I heard that noise and I heard the metal hitting the concrete, I knew exactly what had happened. And as I was walking outside, I heard Angel. It's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. It's not, it's okay, Chase. It's, it's all right. And as I opened the door and he heard Dad walk out onto the deck, Jace turned and ran <laughs> and hid in the playhouse. <laughs> Dad, I heard you walking on the deck and I was afraid, so I ran and hid. Jace ran into the playhouse, and I came out, and I saw what had happened. And I said, Jace, get over here. He came out. I said, were you hanging on the rim? No. Isaiah, yes. (laughs) Jace, were you hanging on the rim? Dad, I wasn't hanging on the rim, Isaiah. Yes, you were, Jace. Don't lie. (laughs) Jace, I'm going to give you one more chance. Did you hang on the rim? I I only hung on it for like one second. <laughs> Isaiah, Isaiah, you hung on it for like seven seconds. I said, Jace, what did I tell you about hanging on the rim? Not to do it? Okay. I said, I'm not mad at you. I'm not mad at you. It's okay. I'm not mad. And my disappointment, do I wish you would have listened to my warnings initially? Yes. But this doesn't change my love for you. This doesn't change the way I feel about you. This doesn't change who you are to me. I forgive you. It's okay. It's not that big of a deal. We'll move on. But now there's consequences. Now you won't be able to play basketball in your backyard like you used to. Now you won't have the freedom that you used to. And that's what God's saying. God's saying, look, it's okay. I'm not mad at you. Do I wish you wouldn't have eaten from that tree like I told you to? Absolutely. But I'm not mad at you. But there are consequences. You do have to leave the garden. You ain't got to go home, but you can't stay here. (laughs) Ladies, childbirth will suck from here on out because of this. Guys, you will have to work the land from here on out. Look, there are consequences, but that doesn't change the way I see you. That doesn't change who you are to me. See, look, there are things that I've done in the past that have warranted Jace's reaction, okay? I've responded several times in a way that I should not have. I've reacted more loudly and probably more aggressively than I should have at times. And so for Jace to run and hide in that instance, I understand that. Like, I understand it. 
dad's going to be mad, so I'm going to go and hide. But look, it's okay. It's good. I love you. You're forgiven. I've warranted that reaction. There are things that I've done that I have warranted that. God did nothing to warrant the reaction that they gave. But in their shame, it changed the way that they viewed him. In their shame, they reacted in proportion to the way that they felt that God was going to react. See, this morning you may be sitting here in your shame. You might be sitting here unable to see God for who he truly is. And the one thing that's keeping you from experiencing the fullness of God's love, the fullness of his forgiveness, the fullness of his grace and his mercy is your shame. God looks down and says, I love you. There's nothing that you could do that would cause me to love you any less. There's nothing. Listen, in your worst moment, God still looked down on you and said, I'm going to send my son to die for this. In your worst moment, Jesus looked at you and said, I don't have to, but I love him so much, even in this moment, that I will still bear that cross. I wouldn't have. I would have said, sorry, good luck on your own. But Jesus looked at you and loved you in the midst of your sin, in the midst of your despair. There's nothing that you could do that would cause God to love you any less. There's nothing that you would do that would cause him to love you anymore. He loves you, period. So the whole, you know, I'm ashamed and God doesn't love me, or on the flip side, I'm going to be as good as I can possibly be so God can love me more. Look, he loves you exactly the same. His love is never changing. And so this morning, if you're here and your shame is, is causing you to view God differently than who he really is, this morning you need to let him take that away. And the third thing is this, he wants to take your shame away. God wants to take your shame away. See, God specializes in taking shame away. The Bible says that for those that believe, they will never be shamed. He wants to take your shame this morning. See, what happened is, is, is Adam and Eve felt shame, so what did they do? They went and they sewed together fig leaves, and now they're in this garden with fig leaves for clothing. And as I was, re- as I was reading this, it just popped into my head that Adam and Eve were the very first episode of Naked and Afraid. (laughs) Have you guys seen the previews for that show on the Discovery Channel? They put two people out in like the middle of nowhere for like 30 days naked and they have to like survive. Like, I don't want to go spend a month in the Brazilian jungle, let alone naked, with somebody that is just ridiculous. And so they always make these little clothes for themselves. And so as I was reading this, it just, Adam and Eve, Naked and Afraid. Right on, that's pretty cool. And so what do they do? They sewed together fig leaves and covered themselves, right? And as I thought about that, I thought, what good are fig leaves going to do? Like, if it starts raining, even if it gets windy, like, you know, there's a stiff breeze today, Adam. You might want to put a couple more leaves on. (laughs) What's a fig leaf going to do? It's not going to do anything to protect you. But nevertheless, in their shame, they tried to cover it. They tried to cover their shame, and the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, that then Adam named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. In verse 21, the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and for his wife. See, God shows up, and he's like, what did you do? Well, we ate from that tree, and I'm afraid because I didn't want want you to see me naked. And God says, look, it's okay. It's all right. Do I wish you wouldn't have? Sure, but that doesn't change anything. It doesn't change the way that I see you. It doesn't change the way that I feel about you. I've already forgiven you because I loved you. I was just wondering how long you were going to stay hidden because of it. This morning, it's time for you to come out of your hiding. God says, what are you wearing? (laughs) What is is this? Where have you been shopping? I just made this. It's organic. It's, it, it's, it's on trend. Guy says, I don't care if it's on trend. It looks stupid. And he comes and he makes clothing made of animal skins. Guy says, take off that leaf and here's a leather jacket. Oh, all right. Thanks, God. This morning, you've been trying to cover your own shame and you've been doing a terrible job at it. As long as you try, 
and fix your shame, it will never do what needs to be done. It will never take it away. You will always feel that. You will always be that. You will always have the enemy sitting on your shoulder lying to you and lying to you. You're unlovable. You're unworthy. What makes you think God will forgive you? What makes you think your kids will forgive you? What makes you think anything good will happen? Look at the things that you've done in the past. What makes you think that's even possible? You've been trying to cover your shame, and God says, look, I've been here the whole time. I saw what you did. I've already forgiven you because my love is so great. And I've got this new leather jacket for you to wear. If you would just put down your stupid fig leaves, stop trying to hide behind a tree in your shame. Stop trying to to hide a tree behind your self-righteousness and your actions. And and I'm just going to look good on the outside so nobody really sees what's going on. If you take that off and put on God's clothing, God says, I will take the shame away. I will take the shame away and you will experience my love like you've never experienced it before. For those of you that are sitting in here wondering, does anybody love me? God says, I love you more than you could even comprehend. Those of you that are in here this morning saying, God can't forgive you. God says, look, when I said seven times seven, it wasn't for everybody else and not you. You weren't excluded in that. How many times should I forgive? God, is your forgiveness... Absolutely. The questions that you've been thinking, the lies that you've been believing about yourself today, it's time to let those go and allow God to put that leather jacket on you, to wrap his arms of love around you, to take off those coverings that you've made to try and make yourself look presentable. God says you just look ridiculous in the process. And it's not really doing what needs to be done. The only thing that can is when you come to me. This morning in closing, And as Nathan's coming back, I want to close with this scripture. It's a scripture found in Romans chapter 8. Verse 35 says, What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verse 37 says, No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons, neither things present or things to come, or any powers, or any height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Stand with me this morning.